Hey everybody, this is John Michael. I'm here with a bunch of people. We'll just go around the table and introduce ourselves. But we're talking about native plants. <laughs> so um, let's get started. To my left, we have... Jillian North. And what do you do here? Water conservation specialist. Why are you on the podcast about native plants? Because I love native plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody knows it. We all know it. Yeah. So that's why, that's why she's here. <laughs> and then I, I'm Hilda. I'm with uh, uh, community engagement... Um, section here in the water department and michelle birmingham conservation specialist and me so i'm just going to ask the group what's your philosophy on native plants so you're looking at me first so i feel like i should answer first and you're the biggest native plant well, fan we already well, went over that so my philosophy on native plants is that they are preferable and largely superior to the plants found at most, most large-scale home goods stores. Um, part of the problem that we see in the environment is the invasiveness of some species and the detrimental effects that go along with them um, that could cause harm to our environment if they persisted um, simply because we think that they look good. So I think that native plants also look good but can withstand drought and things that are, um, you know, that we experience here. Do you guys have a philosophy? Or a reason, a reason to prefer native plants over um, uh, other ones? So before I came into the water department, I had no idea what native plants were or that there was even, even such a term. Um, but now that I'm here and I've heard Julian talk so much about native plants, yeah. it I found out that, you know, they're cheap. Mm -hmm. They're cheap to sustain. They give you lots of color. And they don't require too much water or maintenance, so it makes it really, really easy for a um, first-timer gardener to come in and thrive those those plants. I agree. Michelle was just about to introduce herself. Oh, yeah. Her or policy. did you want to talk about your Her philosophy? Mine, philosophy. Native. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> all, the, all, the, all the above? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pro. I'm no, I was about to say pro-native, and that sounded really wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, Thanks I'm definitely pro. <laughs> I'm definitely pro-native plants. Yeah, yeah, pro-native plants. Why? Um, you know, I know they're. That's me. John Michael. John Michael's cell can everybody phones put, off. Like their phones, like on the seat. Well, mine's on. Because I can hear me. Oh, because then they vibe and stuff. Well, just everybody's just playing, playing with their phones. Okay. Yeah, it's just a, like a and tick. And this is clicking on the it's table. A natural tick. I know, I know. I, I would too if I had it here. <laughs> Whoa. Sassy. Getting, you, getting, you ate lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs> getting bossy <laughs> over here. <laughs> oh, it's off. Please send him okay. today. I don't know what issues. It's like that bird those. you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says they're coming after us with knives. Okay. You know what? That's okay. <clears throat> We're back. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, I'm very pro-native plants. Um, I definitely think it's a good idea. It's better for the environment, uses less water. Um, and those are things that are important to me. So if I could just play a little devil's advocate here, I was mm -hmm. recently reading a book and this is going to be a total surprise to everyone here. Yes. <laughs> I was recently reading a book called how plants work, the science behind the amazing things plants do by Linda Chalker Scott published by timber press in 2015. And I just, and I think that her philosophy on native plants disagrees with uh, Jillian. So I wanted to spring this on Jillian as a total surprise, like I said, and see what, um, what Jillian thinks about it. So I'm just going to read this. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Total surprise. <laughs> okay. The practice using only native plants for landscaping. Okay. The supposed benefits Native species are adapted to the area, so they require less water and fertilizer and are more resistant to local diseases and pests. That's pretty much what you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Good so far. Yeah. Okay. Now. The twist. I have to. <laughs> we have to. How plants respond. If you and your plants live in a developed part of the world, you aren't really in the original native environment anymore. Land once dominated by forests or grasslands no longer has much of these original plant communities left. Soils have been stripped and compacted and amended. Urban areas aren't natural, and some of the plants that once grew there won't tolerate these drastically different conditions. Those that do hang on, those that do hang on may be more susceptible to opportunistic pests and diseases rather than more resistant. Mm -hmm. 
and stressed natives may well require additional water, fertilizers, and pesticides in their struggle to survive. Limiting one's garden to strictly native species can decrease your plant diversity, which in turn limits the diversity of birds, insects, and other nifty animals that can enrich your landscape. Instead, make room for some wisely chosen non-invasive ornamentals that can improve species diversity, provide resources for wildlife, and be aesthetically appealing. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> right? Did I just drop a bomb that, on you? That was a bomb. Okay. Yeah. That was a truth bomb. What do you think? Well, okay. So can I post a disclaimer that I did research this just a little bit, even though I'm going to cut this out, even though your question was surprising. Okay. Um, can I just tell everybody that I, and it's just you and me listener. They can't hear us. I redacted a PDF of the questions I sent to Jillian and she somehow got around it and read this in secret. So this wasn't a surprise. I'm a detective. No, that's why I'm in a bad mood in case you can't tell. (laughs) Can hear it in your voice. No. So I can see the point that the author is trying to make um, about the soil profile when they go in and they clear a development, you know, obviously they strip down that first layer of soil. And so anything that they put back is usually a generic top soil. So I understand what, what, the author is trying to say there. Um, I do disagree. And and I do think some of that logic is a little bit misleading. Um, I don't know if everybody else agrees, but um, you know, I, I don't agree that because the soil profile of an area has changed that we should encourage further ecological damage um, by planting non-native plants. And it's true that some colonies of species have developed over decades, if not centuries, and that with urban development comes a disturbance of the very environment that these particular native plants rely on. Um, but I don't think it follows that um, we should continue the practice of building upon the different conditions that the author suggests, like urbanization, um, you know, more concrete, you know, permeable surfaces. We should um, be doing what we can to reduce those things. Um, because when you go in and you, you may change the soil profile, but a plant doesn't exist just for itself. Um, it doesn't exist in a microcosm. It's, it's not only about the soil. Um, it's about the birds and the bees that rely on it. It's about, you know, um, the climate conditions that are in that area. Native plants are adapted to these things. And um, not only are we choosing these plants because we, we think that they look good and they'll survive. We're choosing these plants because it supports the entire ecosystem of the area. So native plants, um, you know, can withstand drought and less water. And that's, you know, yes, th- initially they may need um, pesticides and fertilizer. I, I don't necessarily think that's true, um, that they will need more uh, pesticides and fertilizers. I think that all of those things end up in our waterways and that we should be doing what we can to reduce our use of those. Um, but, yeah, so I think that, you know, it's it's almost like saying that, you know, we're throwing gasoline on the fire almost or, like, it, it's just, it's, a, it's too much of a bad thing, you know. Well, just... Because if everyone chooses non-native plants, then the bees, the birds, you know, all of those animals that were here before us, they're not going to have food sources. They don't even recognize a pansy. They're not going to recognize a pansy to eat, you know, or they're not going to recognize, you know, I mean, so it's, it's really just kind of about supporting the ecosystem that's in place. Well, she doesn't advocate only... She's not saying get rid of native plants or whatever. Right, whatever. right. I think, and, and that's, and that, to, to that point, I think it's really just throwing gasoline on the fire. Like I was saying, like, I mean, choosing non-native plants over native ones, it's just furthering that ecological damage that if everyone selects mostly non-native plants, like you find in a home goods store, then you know, we're not, we're not going to have as many food sources for butterflies and bees. And nobody wants to go out in their yard and look at a a wasteland, you know, Mm -hmm. with no, you know, butterflies and, and, you know, um, I recent, okay. So last night I have to tell this story. Sorry. I know I'm talking a lot, but I have to tell this story. So I grew up like catching fireflies. Like I loved, I would spend hours outside catching fireflies and I love them. Like I, in, in my husband and I's, um, like in our wedding, we had everyone do like a firefly, um, like thing. They like stamped their finger in like yellow ink and put it on a, 
like on a thing. Mm-hmm. And then they were all fireflies around this little mason jar with oh. me and Garrett's fireflies in it. <laughs> and, and so I love them. And I hadn't seen them in a long time, mainly because a lot of the habitat has been destroyed. Um, last night, I saw fireflies. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. and, I, and I was really excited by that. Sorry, side story. No. <laughs> um, oh, I want to add I, something to that, which mm-hmm. I think oh, yeah. also... So another aspect that I don't even think she's even considering is if you are, and I know she's not completely non-native, but she definitely mentioned the word ornamentals and having those in your Mm -hmm. garden. Mm -hmm. I mean, from, and I know this might be a little tangential, but um, if you're purchasing ornamentals, you, things that are not native that are going to need more fertilizer. I mean, you're supporting whole industries, Mm -hmm. um, things that are depleting resources for items that aren't even meant to survive in the area that they're at. So it's not just as simple as um, a simple ecosystem. It's everything that goes with the Mm -hmm. upkeep, the having a constantly, I mean, is this lady owned by some Florida plant industry? (laughs) You know what I mean? Is she in big fertilizer? Is she in the pocket of big fertilizer? She got some stock market, um, some shares in the fertilizer Mm -hmm. industry. I mean, seriously, you know, having to rebuy the, (laughs) having to rebuy plants over and over. It just doesn't really make sense. Can I, if I can just pop a disclaimer on her, is that she lives in gardens in, I think, Seattle. Okay, they get a lot more rain Mm. than Uh, we do. Now, she's writing to a general audience but she's not having to deal with the kind of drought conditions that we have to deal with right. here in that's Texas. True. That's not right. even so. a consideration. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, to that point, even, I mean, the truth is that North native, North American native plants are disappearing at an alarming rate. And so anything that we can do to conserve those species, I think uh, benefits the whole, yeah. you know, ecosystem, even, even in our, our area, just, you know, in North Texas. And how she was talking about, you know, basically like this is urban. So what's the whole point? That's completely false because the truth of the matter is, is if you have properties that have native plants, they can act as bridges to larger areas, to larger forested areas, native areas. So an, um, a butterfly, a specific animal could could literally like spend some time in your backyard mm-hmm. yep. and find a way to the nether, other backyard with native plants and eventually yep. make it to a more... Um, you know, natural habitat. Yeah, so I heard they're trying to make a, a monarch uh, trail yes. where they have what milkweed yes. or whatever at yes. spots where they can get to their migration yep. areas. I don't know why I heard that. But. Yep, way stations, mo- monarch mm. way stations. Yeah, to that to that point, I'm I don't use the jargon that you all are using right now, and I'm not an expert on native plants, but I do like. We're to not use either. Them. <laughs> no, no, we're not an expert. <laughs> yeah. I actually am. So if I say something. <laughs> Dumb. No, it's because I'm no. not an expert, but I do consider from what I've experienced that before I used any native plants at a home, I wouldn't you I wouldn't see uh, up to ten butterflies in my garden or yeah. more, or even bees or yeah. the different types of birds that I see now that I started using the uh, the native plants. It is such a change, mm-hmm. and I love it. My kid loves it. We are actually outside every afternoon. Um, Looking at the plants because now we don't water anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten right. so much rain lately that yes. there's no need to be watering right yeah. now. And so just to go outside and and be feel like you are out in the wild because I have a bunch of plants mm-hmm. and yeah. and be able to look at the butterflies that you didn't before yes. or the birds or the squirrels or you know it is so such a good feeling to yes. to to be able to have that exactly. That to me, it doesn't matter. I I prefer the native plants with the other plants that I would buy every year. It was the same mm-hmm. plants buying over and over again. Mm-hmm. They just died and I wouldn't see any mm-hmm. of what I'm seeing right now. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I do have some non-native plants in my garden. I mean, I, I, there's things that I just think are pretty and I think that that's good. Um, but the majority of what I'm looking for is, is native and, and I'm, I'm going to choose a native plant. Um, species over a non-native species because um, it's just to me there's such a lasting benefit yes. like you're talking about um, but I don't think that necessarily like a homogenized landscape where there's a monoculture you know is a good environment for anyone and it's also I just don't think aesthetically pleasing also grass I mean yeah it's not that simple I have horrible <laughs> grass right now at my yeah. house and it looks horrendous and I don't think I'm going to I converted one area to native 
and uh, I just took one of our water saving seminars hey. and like it started clicking because I finally had turf to work with. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was fine figuring out, I, I really thought I could get away with not doing pre-emergence. I didn't want to do fertilizers. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I'm going right. to let my grass just be. And it literally is the worst looking grass in the entire neighborhood. So <laughs> nobody, no. nobody from the neighborhood is listening. No, it really is. But, um, and then, but it kind of clicked like this needs management. I mean, if I want my grass to look nice, it, it, I need to throw down a pre-emergent twice a year. I Mm -hmm. need to be adding nitrogen to my um, grass at least once a year, which is things that I found out. And so in other words, it still takes maintenance. It still takes time and care. And if if that was all native, I probably, I wouldn't need to do almost any of that. Right. I have all native turf and I can tell you that I have not done anything. Yeah. What kind of turf turf is it again? I got the Zoiza Palladesia. Yeah. Palisades. Palisades. Yeah. 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 And so I placed it. That's a great. So I replaced the entire thing. Actually, my puppies kind of helped me do that. (laughs) They came in and they tore down everything. And I got the Zoiza maybe two, three months ago. Mm -hmm. And thankfully it's been raining. I have not done anything to it. And it is just flooring. That's awesome. Have you had to That's cut it? That's great. I have not cut it. Oh my goodness. See, I hate That's cutting amazing. grass. That's yeah. the worst thing. Yeah. Nobody likes cutting grass. And the maintenance that goes into kind of like the lawns that are just one type of, of turf grass. You know, I mean, it, it if you had an entire yard of that, then you would have to be constantly worried about weeds and, mm-hmm. you know, all kinds of things. Um, but um, it sounds like that's a really good alternative. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. And then in front, I have a ground cover, so I don't have to worry about any yeah. cutting at all. That's at great. All. I'm jealous. <laughs> so. so, you know what, Linda? You just got burned. <laughs> um, no. I was like, who's <laughs> Linda? <laughs> yeah. I'm really I was like, is take John Michael out. okay? His first name. Yeah, <laughs> dropping the first name. <laughs> I'll probably take that out. Um, so what? what's everybody's favorite native plant, if you had to pick one? Nandina for me. Oh, yeah. It's like choosing favorite children. Or I got roses. <laughs> <or two>. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you say favorite, just favorite plant, just any favorite Fa- plant? A native plant. Um, man. I, there's so many. So I, many. I'm a prairie Rye girl. Guys. Like, I'm a prairie girl at heart. I love the prairie grasses, the prairie, you know, prairie wildflowers. And so one of my favorite wildflowers that I see pop up, and it's almost like you have to search for it. Um, it's called Romer's Mimosa. And it's um, it basically it looks like a plant out of, like, the Lorax or something, or Horton Hears a Who. Yes. Like, it looks like it's out of Dr. Seuss. And it, like, it is just the most gorgeous little plant and i it smells like cherries like Mm. it's just wonderful um but it's really only found in like i've never found it in a in in like a garden store you know i've never found it at a at a box store um so you kind of have to go out into the wild and kind of look for it you know out in the prairie but that's that's one of my favorites michelle um my turn um I really like the blue salvias. So like yeah. the mystic spires, yeah. Yeah. those are one of my favorite. Perfect. They're really, they grow really large, yes. just blue. And I didn't know this. Um, and also, and I'm really not trying to do this as a plug. This is totally happening again. In one of our water saving seminars, I didn't realize that how, like blue is technically not a color that plants are. They're all shades of violet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But even then, yeah. th- that color is really rare for plants. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Uh, I, th- I think that it's okay if you, if you plug our own stuff on our own podcast. Okay, I think that's, that's fine. True. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're not making any I'm money. I'm not off. like a corporate shirl, yeah. so I just don't <laughs> want anybody to get confused. <laughs> <laughs> but it just kind of keeps, I've learned a lot from our classes from having to sit on them for five years. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Are there, I'm going to wait for that to, we're getting a fax. Fax. Yeah. Machine. Someone faxing a question in, that would be amazing. Oh, maybe. maybe I should check it. That would be amazing. I love it. All our listeners out there. Um, Please speak better. I'll keep that. Um, are there any native plants that are really easy to grow that you might recommend to someone who doesn't have a whole lot of experience? 
yeah, that indigo spires or the the mystic blue spires or I mean any of the sages, um, you know, salvia gregei or anything like okay. that. I mean, those are extremely easy to grow. They will, um, they don't need any extra water, fertilizer, anything like that mm-hmm. to stay green um, and and flowering and growing, um, and they'll come back every year. Mm-hmm. So I, I really do think that that's a good one. The nandina too is yeah. the one that looks like it has died on you, and that's what I thought. But then it comes back, and it's just extremely dry i see it and then it's like it's it's dead it's completely dead but it comes <laughs> back and yeah i would say lantana too and you yeah, can yeah, find yeah. lantana now you can find it like everywhere yeah so it's really simple yeah it's cute little flowers yeah. they got white mm-hmm. ones and yellow ones and pink ones oh that yeah. does sound cute mm-hmm. yeah that is um, cute. i forgot it's to say my favorite oh uh, what is your favorite? uh beauty berry Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. American beauty beauty plant? yeah beauty okay. berry is nice because sure. um, it sounds like uh yeah. like uh Magic potion berry. It so. does. It does. Can you eat them? Yeah. Ooh. Eye of toad and beauty berry. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like a, something would yeah. be in Harry Potter. <laughs> right. Mash it up. Right. Can you eat them? No. No. Oh. Birds, birds eat them. Oh, birds yeah. eat them. Well, never mind. I take that back. Yeah. Um, Don't feed them to anyone. How long does a plant have to exist in a particular area before it's considered native? That's a really good question. Are you back, um, is that borderline existential? We're getting really <laughs> deep here. Yeah. So. Um, so I had a botany professor that always said, like, you go back to the the last like glacial retreat or the last um, like uh, the last time that your your area went through a huge climate change. Um, so in our area, I mean, it could be you know two hundred fifty thousand years, you know, of of certain species. Um, becoming adapted to the climate oh, and wow. and and it really does just go back to that um, that last climate change mm-hmm. that happened. Um, oh, that's fascinating. So, um, which is more of a global thing, but in our in our microcosm here, you know, um, I don't know specifically what that answer would be, but yeah, I just meant in general. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. really cool. And though. I I think it's as long enough. It's it's long enough for the the different species to become adapted to one another, like, you know, certain grasses or certain Mm -hmm. birds or certain, you know, for them to all become adapted to one another. Well, that brings us to our next question. Um, I have an unpopular theory um, that I've gotten a lot of flack for, especially with uh, my wife, um, that the blue bonnet is really just a weed. And what even is a weed? Okay. Okay. What is a weed? That's another existential question. <laughs> um, First of all, yeah, why do you hate blue bonnets? I don't what, hate them, but what, I, why, I, what's your thing against blue bonnet? Um, I'm I'm not from Texas, and I think that when like when blue bonnets are out, it's all you people talk about. So and have you gotten your do, blue bonnet? Did picture you know? Yet? Okay, I just have to drop this fact. Did you know okay. that our our it could have been our state flower or state plant could have been it was i think that the other um varieties that were on the table were cactus Ugh. cacti or cotton which oh, is not gosh. i mean those are not good so no. blue bonnets i feel like That's are probably the very, best choice out of those other lame good. choices and, and it was um and the 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 group that was pushing for this was called the colonial dames in america of texas and this was in 1901 i pulled that fact just because <laughs> because i thought it was cool so you're really supporting like you know the the, you I know. think they look cool. <laughs> I think that just people being excited about yeah. a weed, if you want to call it a yeah. weed, that I, it's something very <laughs> good. You know? I'm just saying, let, let's think about it. Let's think well, what, about okay. what makes a weed a weed. I will say, there's, so there's 250,000 plant species. 3% are considered weeds. So 3%, that's not a huge, huge... Out of all plants? Out in of the all world? plants. Yeah, so, um, and there's actually an, a project called Invasive Paper Project, where they take weeds and, and certain invasive, um, like, species, mm-hmm. and they turn it into paper, oh, which I think neat. is really cool. That is cool. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a side tangent. Um, but out of all of those weeds, I mean, there's kind of some things that I feel like weeds have that other plants don't, some characteristics like um, they proliferate quickly, you know, they, they produce massive amounts of seeds, you know, so that, you know, they can spread really easily and they usually tend to want to um, like 
you know, the, it, you'll find them in any environment, like, you know, disturbed areas or even, you know, um, in monocultures, they can sprout up, you know, so it's, it's the seed kind of proliferation and, and blue bonnets don't really have that blue bonnets, you know, they, they do need specific requirements. They do have a long, longer growing period. They have a longer life cycle, so they need the stratification. So blue bonnets are actually in, and, and they have to be like, they, they don't like, you know, um, pampered environments. Mm-hmm. They like to grow in those areas that are that are um, rocky soil. Like or by the side of the road in the ditch. Like by the side of the road in the ditch. Which so is a point a for my plan. argument. So I feel like they're like a great, you know, representation of, you know, a tough, of a yeah. tough Texas <laughs> yeah. plant. Like it, it's, you know, it's going to grow and it's going to be, you know, it's you know, tough and it can withstand the elements. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Can't, okay. So that's my wh- take the, on it. The only reason I started thinking about this is one, I came up with that theory just to, just to make my wife mad. <laughs> and, but this, this year I noticed, um, I put in some container gardens in the back. My dad helped me build them and we st- I started growing some plants there. And I didn't plant any blue bonnets, mm-hmm. but all of a sudden blue bonnets are sprouting up in that dirt that That's I bought awesome. from Home Depot. Were you excited? No, you no, weren't. I wasn't excited. excited no. Because but I was wondering how did birds. how did they get there? The birds. Birds oh, dropped yeah, them. Okay. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wind. Mm-hmm. Well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Possibly. I'm Okay. Yeah. I stand corrected. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But weeds are actually that that's a good point that weeds are kind they are a plant an undesirable plant in, in a, in a place that you don't want it to be like mm-hmm. a dandelion in a, in a, in a yard. Mm-hmm. Like that's, it if it's a weed out. to me. Right. Well, it's not it's categorized like specifically as a weed. I feel like, okay. the, but, well, but we can, <laughs> I don't really, agree to I don't really, I don't really believe that it's a weed, but um, I'm just trying to play a little plant devil advocate. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this might be a good time for me to say that I don't hate Texas, okay? I've got a lot of flack. That's very good because you're in Texas. <laughs> from <laughs> you're, you're a Texan now. We got one very negative comment from a listener. When I got home, she told me that she heard the, the episode where I... What listener? I'm just wondering. <laughs> where I was talking to Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife, and I was pretty hard on my last hometown of Houston. Yeah, didn't you say that it was like what? Houston was... <laughs> Let's not get into okay. it. But I did. But, but what I said was, why did pioneers stop there? Why did they decide right. to stop? Why didn't they just keep going? Right, okay, I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so she pointed out that I was a little bit, a little bit hard on Houston, and I just want to say some things that um, I like about Houston. Okay, just real quick. I like the Astros. Okay. Um... I worked at the Space Center for a little while, and I got to meet Gene Kranz, the Apollo 13 uh, flight director. Oh, nice. Um, twice. Mm. Um, Two my favorite, one of my favorite rappers is from there, and I met him. Two, three, three Bun three. B, so I'm going to shout out to Bun B. Um, yes. Who's is that? <laughs> it's That's you, you again. <laughs> <laughs> Bone off, John Michael. <laughs> Yeah, my wife is from Houston, and um, so it's four things, five mm-hmm. things, yeah. four things. Yeah. So you fixed okay. it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But now Texas we're all good. I can big, stop yeah. getting hate, hate comments when I get home. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what are some particularly harmful invasive species that we need to be on the lookout for? Honeysuckle. Um, really? Honeysuckle. It's yeah. Everywhere. It's everywhere and it's, it's invasive. Yeah. Yeah. There's a coral honeysuckle that's native and it's, mm-hmm. it's, it, and it actually has a, a, a massive benefit to, to birds, but, um, and, and hummingbirds, but it's, but the Japanese honeysuckle is, is a non-native that's particularly invasive. Um, and, um, I mean, there's a number of others that, um, aren't coming to mind right now but um the bamboo i know it's not bamboo bamboo, yeah Yeah, bamboo bamboo gets gets out of control Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be careful with that um are there any uh are there any really weird plants that you guys are into so I have, just because you've seen my office, um, I have air plants, mm-hmm. um, Tillandsia, um, and I, I, I really 
love those for especially for an office environment or an indoor environment just because they're low light and they um, air plants don't need any um, they're epiphytes so they don't need any and they take water out of the atmosphere like out of the air and um, they don't need any like really extra watering other than um, soaking them every now and then Um, so I really love I really love um, air plants they're really fun do you guys have any weird plants not weird, but I just started my um, lufas. Yeah, oh, I love that. <laughs> my Good. lufas are sprouting, so I'm very, very excited. I about shared those. some <laughs> seeds with yes, Hilda last year for <laughs> some lufa <laughs> seeds because I was really like excited. The I had n- yeah, mm-hmm. okay, so I had never grown them before. I knew that they were, you know, they're plants. Mm-hmm. They come from plants, but I had never grown them before. Like the ones that you find in the store are really just a big. It's a it's a it's big a gourd. It's, yeah, it's it looks crazy. like a gourd, mm-hmm. and, and I, I had. And I had all these extra seeds um, after I had cleaned the the loofah and cut it up and everything and made it into um, so so that it was usable and dried it and everything and I had all these seeds so I'm glad I, like yes. I'm glad that those are those are taking so, off yeah so I lost <laughs> the season to plant them last year and so this year I started them so I planted several seeds in earth in the soil mm-hmm. those didn't give anything yeah. but then. Um, Dottie on Facebook recommended me starting them inside. So what I did yeah. is I had had a uh, uh, paper towel mm-hmm. and I damped those, mm-hmm. put the seeds in there and just left them near the window inside a plastic bag. Yeah. And sure enough, all of them sprouted. And so mm. I, I made awesome. the transition yesterday into the soil and so they're doing it. Yay! Oh, <laughs> they yeah. will climb exciting. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was one of my other questions. Are there what are some ways to increase uh, seeds germination rate? And that was the exact um, technique that you told me yeah. to use on my yep. hot pepper plants. Yes, I got some Carolina reapers growing. I got some yeah. um, some kind of ghost pepper. That is pretty. All cool. the hot ones. Yeah, yeah. And um, and it worked. So they're all they've all sprouted. They're Good. getting up there. So I got to transplant them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's awesome. That's I'm exciting. glad that yeah. worked. Yeah. So um, so you put them in a put them on a paper towel. Yep. Sandwich them, right? Yeah. Soak, yeah, soak so, them or, or sandwich them in a paper towel. Sometimes if you soak them overnight, um, it helps. And then you sandwich them in a paper towel um, so that they're fully covered and you keep the towel kind of moist. And you can sometimes you can like tape it to a window or like in a mm-hmm. sunny location, you know, um, and make sure that it stays moist until they germinate. And then put them in the, put them in the ground or put them in a pot, you know. What are some... Maybe there, maybe nobody will have anything to say about this. But what are some ways that you? What are some ways to? No, no, wait. Are I'm you sorry. saying this is a question that wasn't on your list? No, it's on I my list. I don't know if I can deal with surprises. <laughs> any more I surprises? Think, <laughs> I think we've already <laughs> covered this. But okay. what? What are some ways you've used native plants in your landscapes? Oh, great question. So we. Um, there's a number of different ways that we have um, in, that I personally have incorporated um, native plants into um, our landscape. I um, started this year. I moved into a new house, so um, it's the first kind of uh, year for me to get start getting things established. And I took out a lot of things that I didn't like um, that were non-native. Um, and um, I kind of had a row of standing cypress, which is a really tall prairie flower that, you know, hummingbirds love. And I mixed those in with some um, gay feather or liatris. And, and it's just beautiful. Those are blooming now and they're great. And they'll just continue to kind of, um, you know, kind of spread out next year. So I'm really looking forward to that. But one of the things that um, I had in my front yard, my front porch had these boxwoods that were just, they really didn't have any benefit to them no ecological benefit really i mean and they were just kind of blah like they're just kind of there and so i took those out um because we had an opportunity to participate in this program called garden in a box which we're really excited about um and i actually don't know if i can promo this yet exactly but so you might have to take this out um i think that we can when is this uh, going out i feel like that's a question that happens on every podcast if someone's like when is this going out so can i but if it is, you can cut to the part where I say <laughs> there's um, going to be a program called um, You Plant It, and it's a garden in a box program. And um, so we were able to get demonstration 
gardens going um, at, at a number of different locations. Um, everybody here, you know, got to plant, um, you know, the different varieties that they're going to use in Garden in a Box. They've got a number of different designs. Um, and one of the designs that I chose was for that front planner, you know, where I took out all of these boxwoods, boxwoods and it definitely took me all day to get those out of the ground. Um, but um, I did it. And um, I installed one of the garden in a box. It's got a ton of different milkweeds. It's got, um, you know, oh, so many different varieties, rock rose, um, you know, uh, mealy blue sage. I mean, coreopsis, a ton of different um, plants that are um, going to be really cool looking when they fill out. Just from a PR perspective, they should really think about doing a rebrand on milkweed. Change that name. I think Why? people would be more willing you, to grow oh, it. Because you don't like that name? It's not about me. It's about the public perception. The brand. Yeah, like the, the it's brand the name. it's the brand. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> you think? I'm just being stupid. Yeah. Um, did you have anything else to say? Well, some of the I think different types of milkweeds are called like like butterfly weed. I think that's a pretty name mm -hmm. for. Him. But, I mean, fine. it's still called weed. It. Oh, it's still like makes you think of a weed, but it's it butterfly weed. It's a it's a weed that butterflies. But it's not a weed, it's a plant with flowers. And you know, I think we need to make the point that when you talk about native plants, it's not just plants. You have trees and you have yeah. palms and you yes. have all kinds of mm. other plants. Yes. So whenever they think about native plants, just don't think that are yes. they are the ones with flowers. Yeah. Which is yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's get to some serious listener questions. Okay, okay shoot. The, the other day, uh, I put out a call for questions on social media. And if you don't follow us already on social media, um, you can follow us in English and Spanish on Facebook at Fort Worth Water and at Fort Worth Agua. And on Twitter at FW Water. We also have an Instagram uh, at Save FW Water. So on Facebook, Gary Morris asks, generally, how can wildflower blooms be forecast from region to region? That's a great question, Gary. Um, so there is a, a website called the National Phenology Network, um, and it is um, kind of a, a national forecasting for um, the seasons. So those first blooms that you're going to see or when different blooms are, are going to happen, you can find that um, at usanpn.org. Um, and they actually even have a thing called na nature's, na sorry, nature's Notebook. Um, nature's notebook yeah and you can you can upload like your findings to that i think um i i mean i have to say iNaturalist is a great um resource for finding when um things are gonna you know things that are around you that are blooming you can you know obviously find those um on iNaturalist too um but nature's notebook and um the national phenology um association network Phenology? So, yeah, phenology. How's that spelled? So, P-H-E-N-O-L-O-G-Y. Just like it sounds. Yeah, phenology. And so, um, basically, what it tells you is kind of when things are going to bloom the first, like, few weeks. Um, it's um, It kind of keeps track. It has, like, real-time maps of, like, when things are blooming, which I think is really cool. I'll bet. Um, I bet that gets confused a lot with phrenology because it's know. just one more letter. I think, yeah. And all of a sudden you're talking and about bumps on people's heads. Right. Phrenology. <laughs> is that about the shape of your skull? Yeah, or, the shape yeah, of your skull, the bumps it? in your skull. Can, you can tell crazy. if you're a psychopath or something. That's <laughs> well, this doesn't show if you're a psychopath, but this shows if you are like psychotically into plants, uh -huh. then you, that, like Gary, <laughs> then you, <laughs> do you, <laughs> then do you, you have can a plant go, problem? I do have a plant <laughs> problem. I have a very bad plant problem. It's, it's, it's. Um, I know you do. Yeah. It, it's a, an economic problem on my checkbook. It, it's a social problem. I don't have any friends except for plants, but you know, anyway, I hope that's not going to stay in there. <laughs> He's like, oh, it is. There's no better way to get that to stay in. <laughs> no. Good point. And one more question for the group. 
Do you guys have any books that you'd recommend about plants or gardening in general? So this isn't necessarily about gardening, but it, it is a really good perspective on ecology and um, about woods, the woods and forests and everything. Um, it's called The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel, How They Communicate, and Discoveries from a Secret World, world by Peter Wallenbin. Um, it's a great, great book. Um, I would highly recommend it. And then I also, um, I also would recommend... Botanicum. Yes, that's a lovely book uh, that I recently checked out from our local library for my children, which they have no interest in. But Jillian loved it. Oh, I saw uh, that on your Instagram. I, absolutely. I'm, I'm obsessed with it now, actually. It's just a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, beautifully illustrated book. Yeah. It's um, just kind of like an old-fashioned looking book. Yeah. And it just... It has these beautiful layouts of all mm -hmm. these different um, categories of plants and trees and ferns and lots of different um, types. And it's just, just beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I'll wonderful. bring it back up here. And it's written kind of like for middle mm -hmm. school. I mean, it's meant for for children, but I think um, adults could get a real appreciation for it. Especially, I think, if you want to, I know this is really nerdy now, but <laughs> if you're interested in learning the different plant, you know, genus and species yeah. and in you know, classification, um, it'd be a good, like, mm -hmm. introductory book for that. Oh, that is really nerdy. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Fun for kids and adults. There you go. <laughs> We're oh, laughing sorry. because, like, who, like, 0. .0000% of the population cares about that? <laughs> So but <laughs> this is a way to get them to care. This book could do Wait, that. It is it stunning. It is so good. The, the artwork it's, it's is very so pretty to read as well. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Jillian has been spouting off the Latin names of plants like I spout off Star Trek characters. Ipomoxis so, rubra. That's see. another plant that I didn't n mention. Standing cypress. I love it. Actually, I did mention it because I, I talked about how I'm using native plants. I love that one. But I do like to throw in the scientific names mm -hmm. just because I think no, it's No, I appreciate fine. it. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. And that's how you actually know what the actual plant is, right? Right, because like, yeah. there's a lot of different common names. So mm -hmm. how do you know wh if what you're talking about is what I'm talking about? Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes. It's inside baseball for plant people. you got to say mm -hmm. the right That is name. very true. I wish there were more, like, you know, like leagues for plant teams you know, instead of like sports teams, because I would be all about that. Do you like, think there's if we like a Linnaeus like a, Appreciation Society? I don't know. Like probably for plant classification. Yes. Carl Linnaeus is a personal hero of mine. Like genius. Yeah, but genius. Yeah, it's that's a good idea out there. Maybe it's a good idea. Oh it's man, I thought podcast. I was a nerd. <laughs> 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 where I thought the D and D podcast we're planning is nerdy. Well, this might be nerdy. That's than gonna that. get real nerdy too. <laughs> <laughs> we're just. But throw it all in there. <laughs> and we'd play it like Pokemon cards, you know? We'd like bust right. out with our plant and our Latin <laughs> yes. names. <laughs> yes, I'm all about that life. Our next question comes from Hillary on Instagram. All right. Okay. Shout We're, out, Hillary. Hillary says, do you know Hillary? Is it this? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same Hillary. The Hillary that Hi, we Hillary. Know. Uh, we miss you. At Hillrob? Uh, was it at Hill Rob? Was it that Hillary? It's our Hillary. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. Don't put her Instagram You're handle on blast. Me. Oh. <laughs> put, put her, if you need a real <laughs> Yeah, Homes with Hillary. That's her real estate Sorry, Instagram handle. We can put Hillary. that on blast. Um, <laughs> Hillary asks, where can I find them to buy them? I think she's talking about native plants. Mm -hmm. How do I know which ones to buy? Great question. I tried well, to say it like Hillary. she would. You said it exactly. Yeah. Like she, she needs to sign up for a program that's coming up. Right? Yeah, Garden in a Box <laughs> will give them to you. No, um, so there's a, a number of different places to, to buy them. Um, but like I said, it, it is difficult to find um, true natives in um, box stores or in home goods stores that are, you know, um, pretty um, readily available. If, if you want to find some... Um, in your area, I would say you definitely need to, to research it a little bit. Sometimes it is harder to find um, local growers who will um, have a good selection of native plants. But mm -hmm. um, honestly, I think if you are um, looking for natives, that's the first, like, that's the first step. So the more you can um, identify which ones are native, the, the easier it will be to find them. Um, there's a number of different areas in um, Fort Worth um, that sell um, 
you know, native plants. Um, I don't, I don't know if we can like yeah, I don't know either. allowed, but yeah, yeah, I don't think we can promo them. Like but I would just specific Google local plant stores. Yeah. All of them that I'm aware of do have some sort of online presence. And and even if they don't have, um, if you're unsure about the native plants that they do have, you can always ask them and develop a relationship with them and say, can you order this plant material mm-hmm. for me? Or can you, can you get these varieties for me? Because a lot of growers, if you're going to give them business and if you're going to come back time and again, um, then they will go, go that extra mile for you. Um, and I know for me, I really like to find seeds and start growing from seed just because you can get a lot more varieties that you normally don't get um, mm-hmm. in a store. Um, and you can store them for a long time. So if it doesn't work out one season, you can always go back and try again. Um, you just have to next. start early. So that's kind of you the have to trick start there. Way earlier, is, yeah. and, and it takes a little bit more effort. Um, but if you can't find the natives that you you want, um, don't just go the easy route and and get the ones that are that are there at the store. You know, kind of know what you're what you're buying. Um, there's a, a really good little plant list. Um, it's top 100 plants for North Texas that AgriLife, um, or Water University also put together. And, um, it is a great resource of, um, native and adaptive plants. Um, and, and they come in little box sets so you can um, actually get them online at Water University. And, um, I like to, um, pull out all of the cards that I have like in my garden and then the next time I go to the store I buy something that's not in my garden (laughs) so you take the cards with you I do I've got them well and that's the point I have them in my car right now like that's the point is that they're portable they're easy to find and they base their plant selection partially on ones that are um easier to get in the stores right that's that's fun though. I like I like the idea of having those cards with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So to answer your question, Hillary, um, if you're Google. Hillary, you can just text Jillian and she'll tell you. Yep. But everybody <laughs> else can do the, all the stuff that she just said. Eight um, one seven. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, people might be able to guess the last uh, five numbers. Um, or yeah, sure. Or only a, numbers. a few <laughs> options, yeah. you know, nine you know, numbers. Water University has a great website where you can go yes. and just search. Do you have shade? Do you have sunny places? Do, what do you have at home that mm-hmm. you do that filtering in the system? And, and it'll give you a list of whole, a lot of plants that will do their mm-hmm. good. So mm-hmm. you have at least a list of plants that you should be purchasing Mm -hmm. once you find them once you find them Mm -hmm. yeah and and i think that question is a good question because it is hard to find sometimes but um but just keep looking okay so uh let's see our last question comes from a regular listener um and i guess she listened or he who knows listened to um an old episode where i talked about uh, an herb garden that he used to have in Houston and how great it was and how har- much hard, how much harder it is to grow stuff here for me anyway. Mm-hmm. So her, or their question is, can we get an update on John Michael's herb garden? Is he actually going to eat all caps, <laughs> uh, what he grows? Thanks. A concerned citizen. So, um, I think you're the, the answer, only one that can answer, answer that. that. Yeah. Thank you. I'll <laughs> take, I'll take this you. one. I'll take this one. The answer is, and <laughs> well, first of all, what what else do you have besides the peppers? Oh, yeah. oh, good question. Um, I have a lot of dill. Oh, okay. yeah. And I just bought a dehydrator, so I've been dehydrating it. I got a ton of ton of dill. Um, I had a lot of cilantro. That's good. Um, all the that easy stuff, to, easy stuff to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, I had some carrots for a while; they didn't really work out. Uh, I had some radishes that didn't work out. I've got some summer squash that are doing pretty great. Did you ever find out why your radishes and, and carrots, or was it carrots? Mm, or yeah, just, just ca- radishes? No, I had carrots you too, yeah. You um, find out why those those didn't work out? Was it because they were too close together and they weren't getting that's enough a, of their own space? Because the, the leaves would grow like crazy. Yeah, you're supposed to thin them out. The you. radish bulbs would stay small. The leaves, yeah, and mm-hmm. also nitrogen. You could always yeah. do too much, too much, nitrogen too much nitrogen. Okay. Will encourage foliage, but if you, if you, you know, do a soil test, you'll be able to tell. 
But as to eating all the the produce, I don't know. Yeah, that's up you to, to well, that's you. A, that's, only so, you can. Yeah. So to answer your question, listener, you know good and well that we use those herbs all the time that I've dried out. Um, we just ate a summer squash last night that I grew. So you talk to this person like you know. Well, <laughs> I don't think it's a very, it's a very big surprise who the who the person is. So. <laughs> this person has intimate knowledge of your growing patterns. Um, <laughs> I, I asked this listener to please water my plants while I was in Santa Monica. And did she? She yeah. says she did. You were but calling when I got it home, out. It was raining. You were like, it was raining. Yeah. You know, she, it was raining yeah, here right. while we were in Santa Monica? Yes. You don't okay, need to well. water right now. Right. Well, You're saying anyway, that. Does, that, does that answer your question, listener? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's all we have. So you don't eat all your produce, or this is well, aside so, from the question. You can block this, or, mm -hmm. or block, you know, like cut this out. But well, the what? carrots and the rashes didn't work out. I mean, we got maybe three rashes that so were. So is she more the rest bothered of them really that you have things growing that? Is it the waste out. of the produce that bothers no, her? No, I don't. Or is it I don't the, waste it. Oh, I think she. Th I, so <laughs> she has this like running thing that she thinks that I don't like to eat vegetables, mm. which is not true. I just don't prefer them. Okay, um, so she thinks I'm going to grow all these vegetables, and she thought I was just going to—I don't know—grow them and throw them in the trash. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, she has a legitimate concern, but yeah. um, you can share. You can always share. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You can. Yeah, and we—that squash was great. That fact First that you heard earlier—that yeah—that <laughs> fact that you heard earlier was a question from a listener. So here's oh, our here's yeah. another question. Good, good. How closely do you follow the planting guides? If you're pl if you plant something after the allotted time, let's say May. You, let's say May you plant in June. It says May. Oh, it says okay. Yes. It says uh, Go it, ahead. Uh, it says May you plant in June, and harvest time puts you in September. Is that okay? And they didn't sign it, so I don't know who it's from. I think if it grows, it's okay. Like mm -hmm. if it if it survives and can withstand, um, you know, a lot of the times the growing season is for a certain germination um, time frame that plants certain seeds need for, um, you know, temperature requirements, different light conditions, um, and so that's kind of how you get that seasonal pattern. And um, it's my opinion that if you know our, our seasons can change some are longer some seasons growing seasons are longer than others and so i think you can always play with it you can always you can always try um and i think trying and trying again until it works and until you find out the right um growing uh season for that, those plants then um then that's the best approach but i mean i think you should always try and follow it as closely to the to the guidelines um, that are on the packet or, you know, that are on the back of the packet or, you know, um, or if you find it online, I think you should always try to try to stay close to that, but can't hurt to try. Yeah. For example, in the turf class that we just had, but this still applied, applied across the board, um, the expert there who has a PhD in turf, so mm -hmm. I've would wow. take her word for it. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, she was saying that um, much we have normal. had a much cooler um, spring and much mm -hmm. more rain. And that, in fact, she um, suggested in some instances um, you could still do some various plantings and whatnot because those, we've just had an irregular late spring. And so... Um, Again, it's mostly applied to turf, but I think you can apply it to across the board. So it, mm -hmm. like a season like this, you probably could get away um, with planting things a little bit later than mm -hmm. than usual. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it really yeah. is, where you are. yeah, kind of right. a guideline. But a year like this year, you can kind of play with it. So That's a great question, but I am wondering how they got our fax number. So I don't know if we can give that out. It it is, it's online. It is online. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't <laughs> it's not a secret fax number. <laughs> no. um, I think that's everything. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. you. For, um, for coming. Thanks for having us on. Yeah.